Welcome to this episode of the AI Show, where we're going to look at detecting lung diseases from x-rays using machine learning. I have a couple of guests. Why don't you introduce yourself, tell us who you are and what you're sure, doing. Sure, sure. So my name is Xiao Yong. I come from the Cloud AI and Prototype and Innovation team. So my focus is on how to build a model to detect the lung diseases that you just talked about. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Hi, glad to be here. I'm Bharat Sankarnaran. I'm a colleague of Xiao Yong, and I'm actually a PM in the Azure Machine Learning team. Yep. I'm joining him today for today's show and talk, spend some time with you folks. Fantastic. So let's start out with the why and then get into the whole data science process. Sure. So sure. tell us the why or what we're trying to do. Yeah. So actually, you know what? The project was inspired by a few data points that we have collected. So one of the data points that we have is like how the pneumonia is really killing people, right? So like in 2012 alone, uh, in 2015 alone actually, like pneumonia itself kills over 1 million kids over the world. So that's really, really a you know severe disease for of us. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So we say, okay, uh, a lot of areas they are actually equipped with the chest X-ray machines, but they really don't have radiologists to interpret those images right, after they get the result. So the time from you getting the data to your insight is actually quite long. It takes a few days. So we're thinking, if a people such as ha they have pneumonia, a patient has pneumonia, and he come to the clinic, and how we can help him to reduce the time and by using the AI technologies. I yeah. see. So what you're saying is that like in some places there's no radiologist. So even if you do get the x-ray, yeah. they might not look at it for a couple of days and with pneumonia, exactly. I mean it could it could do some damage yeah. real quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah. how do you set up the problem? Where uh, do you get the data? Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, actually a few uh, a few weeks or a few months ago, actually NIH the National Institute of Health released a huge dataset on like pneumonia and a few other 14 uh, actually lung diseases. So we use that public dataset and it has some labels. So we use that label to make the prediction to train the models. And uh, that's basically the dataset. Yep. And so, okay, so usually when I'm looking at a machine learning problem, specifically uh -huh. with imaging, I'm thinking uh -huh. maybe I'll use deep learning. I'm all excited about the modeling. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. there's always this part where you need to like clean exactly. stuff up. Yeah. So why don't you talk about that? So yeah, so basically like, as you can see the image, uh, it has over, as you can see in the slides, it has like over one, uh, a few thousands of images and uh, it contains like 30K unique patients, right? But uh, actually during our journey, we find that some of the labels, they are actually doesn't have good quality and the data itself doesn't have good quality. So we have a script to clean that up a little bit to remove all the, the, uh, all the images that we think they are not good, and we actually published that in the uh, GitHub that we will talk about later. I yeah. see. Yeah. So the first step was trying to figure out what images worked and didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how do you, like, and this is a question, because I'm really good at, like, machine learning theory, uh -huh, uh -huh. but I'm not so good at, like, <laughs> yeah. the practical horse uh -huh. sense machine learning. <laughs> Tell, how did you go about that process? Uh, so uh, maybe we can go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So. Like usually, we will ha already have this piece of data, right? And uh, it's sort of well labeled. And in that case, we really want to see, okay, what can we get from the data set, right? And usually, we will have a already trained model somewhere else or a existing arch architecture to see whether that work or not on this particular data set. I see. Right? So that's why we have this uh, uh, model called a DenseNet. Basically, it's a very it's like the state of art uh, model for image classification. And you can have it has very it's very smart because like usually when you have a very deep neural networks all the gradients will vanish very quickly. Right. So it has some very smart way to you know over to 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 solve that problem. I and see. So yeah. so and this is my understanding. Help me out yeah, if I'm wrong. Yeah, when we're yeah. talking about deep learning, yeah. the deeper the network is, uh -huh. the better regularized it is. But uh -huh. what happens is when mm -hmm. you're doing the back prop, mm -hmm. things start to go to zero, and zeros are bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's why we want to use this dense net because it solves that problem very nicely, and we use a 121 layer neural networks. Usually, you can't train that deep because of the gradient vanishing problem that you just mentioned. So 121 mentioned. here represents how deep the neural net is, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So it's really, really deep. Yeah. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about, about these, you call them dense nets. Yeah, Why, dense what net. makes them more powerful? So if you think about it, right, so if you tr have trained a very deep neural network, like we just talked about, like the gradient will vanish very quickly, right? So the way that dense net overcomes it is that it has a few dense blocks, 
and in each dense block, it has it's saying like instead of passing all the gradients layer by layer, why don't we have a common place to put all the gradients there? So each layer can take a look at all the feature maps in the previous layers. So in that case, it solves the vanishing gradient problem because every layer can access the previous can access the information in all the previous layers. So yeah. help me out because I'm slow, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand regular neural networks, uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. but in this case, each dense block is like uh -huh. its own kind of component mini neural network yes. that then gets yeah, passed yeah, forward yes exactly and yes. so that way you're actually training multiple of them and stacking them together yeah, and yeah. that way like you're actually training a little one yeah and then the other ones are relying on the little ones yes. together okay yeah, sort of yeah and you, so as you, you, yeah. does it also mean that i could peel off any one of those layers and where i want to start with is that the benefit uh no usually you will train a lot uh, like usually right. three or four dense blocks and each dense block has a lot of layers this is cool. Okay, so I'm looking at the picture below, and mm -hmm. I'm getting I'm getting this notion of like convolutional neural networks uh -huh. too, because uh -huh. you're boxing things mm -hmm. like like that. That's yeah. not what that's saying, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yes. so it's just literally like here's some neural networks. We're gonna pass things back and forth, yeah, and we're gonna stack them on top yes, of each other. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. So, and you decided to use this because uh -huh. you felt like you needed a deep network. How do you know like which a model to use. Yeah, so uh, so there are actually a few things. So first, we definitely want to use a deep one because if your is shallow, then the problem is not that good. Mm -hmm. And second, we are also inspired by the Stanford, which they have a similar piece of work. They also use DenseNet. So we say, yeah, okay, why don't we start with DenseNet? Yeah. Okay, so now that you've cleaned the data, uh -huh. you picked a model. Tell uh -huh. us about the whole training process and how you did uh -huh. that. Sure. So after we have this model, so first, of course, data augmentation, as always, right? So basically, like if you think of chest X-ray images, so usually you have you want to flip them left and right, right? But you don't want to flip them up and down because that doesn't make yeah. sense, right? And you also want to zoom in, zoom out a little bit to make sure that works, and also like rotation a little bit because when radiologists or technicians take the radio, uh, take the pictures, so the chest X-ray pictures, usually they don't put it in a very strict uh, vertical. Uh, position. So right. data augmentation is a way of just getting, I need more data. Yeah. And so what you do is you just take all the pictures and flip them. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, flip, yeah, zoom in, zoom out kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. And how many, do you went from, I think it was 30,000 data points or something like that? Uh, yeah, uh, 100,000. 100,000. Uh, how many did you have at the end in order to do training? Yeah, it's like 8x more, so it's like 800,000. Cool, Yeah. that's awesome. Wow. Okay. So and then of course, uh, if you have that, have that, and then you need to set all the training kind of hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. Like the most importantly, learning rate. That's yeah, one, one of the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So we set the learning rate to 0.01. Point, point point oh uh -huh. Yeah, and then we also use another way to, because like if you keep the learning rate high, you skip the minimum. Yeah, exactly. So we we also do learning rate decay, meaning that if the validation doesn't decrease, then we uh, like divide the learning rate by a certain degree. I see, yeah. I see. So yeah. as you're going, it's mm -hmm. the movements towards the, the, the local minima are more mm -hmm. precise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So it's like big step, big step, big step here, and then small step, small step, and then you get the minimum. minimum. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And, it, and it looks like you did a seven to one to two training uh, yeah. training validation data set and you used yeah. the Atom Optimizer, yeah. Yeah. Which, has the, uh, which has the momentum and RMS prop sort yes, of built exactly. in as well. Yes, exactly. So it actually converts very fast. So it usually takes just like three, uh, 30 or 40 epochs to convert. While if you use the standard SGD, it takes like at least 100 epochs to convert. So how long in time did it take to train this thing? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we didn't put it on the slides, but if we use the latest error, uh, you know, a GPU which is P100, it only takes like five minutes for one epoch. But if we use the traditional like old K80 one, it takes like 20 or like 30 minutes. So to, you're saying this yeah. was trained in about an hour? Uh, yeah, an hour or like maybe two hours. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's pretty amazing. Like yeah. just just doing like the 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 the, the learning rate decay uh -huh. and making sure that you're using Atom Optimizer. Uh -huh. Like that's crazy how fast. Yeah, or and, and use the latest Azure GPU. That's right. Okay. <laughs> He's like, and good hardware, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah awesome. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about uh, the sigmoid function. So usually, because if you think about all the diseases, actually some of the diseases can coexist. 
for example, you probably have pneumonia as, as well as nodules, mm -hmm. those kind of things, right? So in that case, it's not a single uh, label problem. It's actually a multi-label problem, right. meaning that each image could have multiple labels, right? In that case, we are using sigmoid because that's kind of the standard for like, you know, multi-label uh, classification problem. I see. And so is the, does the output have multiple Output nodes? Yeah, output. Uh, yeah, uh, fourteen out, uh, output nodes, okay. and each one is ranging from zero to one. I see. Right. While if you use, for example, softmax, then all of the all of the sum is sum equal to one. I see. Right. So here, each each individual like a uh, result is ranging from see. zero to one. I see. I see. So I was confused about that. So like, usually you use softmax, but that's only if you're trying to exclusively say. It's only this one. Yeah, it's only this versus one. Versus this one. one. Yeah. And now you're saying, well, actually, it could be this one and this one yeah, with these exactly. probabilities. Yes. Okay, exactly. that's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. so you trained for 100 epochs, and mm -hmm. then the you selected the best one with the yeah, so select like the best one. Yeah. Okay. And now let's get into like like what environment did you use to to set this all up? Uh huh. So, uh, uh, yeah. So the environment is that we use error, of course, and the, one of the nice thing of error or uh, error data science VM is that you just go there, you say, hey, I want a data science VM, right? I want to use error machine learning to use that as a backend. And you just with a few clicks and it will set up all the things for you. Otherwise, if you want to set everything from scratch, oh man, it takes like yeah, <laughs> a few hours at least. Yeah, we, we yeah. did a show on the, uh, the data science VM and the deep learning VMs uh, uh, and usually you install all this stuff and then mm -hmm. you, you have a hard time later on yeah. Yeah. putting it out. Yeah, and so this, yeah. that's, the that's why we use error machine learning. That's why we use error data science VM as the backend. Awesome. So I saw you had a chart coming up next. What is this telling us? Yeah. So uh, actually, this is just like the training chart. So as you can see, this is like the loss of, of the model. And uh, from the first a few epochs, actually till maybe the 30th epoch, uh, it just uh, decreased. And then from that going on, the validation loss will just go up because they are kind of overfitting on the training data. Got it. Yeah. And so like you, you're like, okay, we're going to pick the model right there at the bottom yeah. because that's the one that, that does the best. Now, yeah, here, and let me just uh, select this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the middle one. one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So then here's another question. What, mm. what did you write this in? Did you use something like TensorFlow or Keras mm -hmm. or something else? Yeah, currently we use Keras and use TensorFlow at the back end. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So. Once you've gone through the process of weeding out the bad data, mm -hmm. augmenting the data, mm -hmm. uh, coming up with a suitable model, mm -hmm. making sure the learning rate and mm -hmm. the optimizers were good, because I'm sure like you ran it the first time, it didn't work, and then you're like, maybe we should do these smart things, the learning mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should use Atom Optimizer. So, yeah. um, what, what output do you get? Mm -hmm. And then how do you actually put this somewhere that it can be used? Yeah. So uh, let's first talk about the Oh, yeah, how, how yeah. good it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, because like uh, we need to have some validation metrics for the model, right? Usually people use like precision or like F1 score. F1 mm -hmm. score is also very great here. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we are using uh, AORC uh, or the RC score. RC score means that hey, this is like the curve here. Like it's saying how, uh, what's the sensitivity of the model mm -hmm. versus the specificity of the model. Basically mm -hmm. it means like uh, how the model can correctly identify the true positive samples as well as the uh, a true negative samples. Got it. Yeah. Because in medical cases, you usually have a very low positive samples, right? For example, in pneumo pneumonia, you probably have a lot of normal people or normal images, and then you have a little bit of pneumonia kind of images. I see. Yeah, and I that's see. why we don't want to use precision, because in that case, the model will say, oh, okay, I have a 99% non like accuracy, but actually it's just to classify everything as negative. And the recall is like some garbage. Yeah, yeah the there. recall is very low. Yeah, yeah. and so I, th that makes sense. And, and, and for those who are listening, if I'm understanding this right, you c if you have a hundred things mm -hmm. and only one of them uh -huh. is the Bad. false, yeah. uh -huh. if you always predict true, uh -huh. you got 99% accuracy. Yeah, which high is accuracy, right? yeah, high accuracy, yeah. yes, but this is useless. Yeah. And, and so that's why you use the ROC curve yeah. to actually see, okay, how are we doing, you know, overall when yeah. the precision versus recall. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. So that's the validation matrix. Um, and uh, also from the test point of view, we also use 10 crops to improve the result. Got 10 it. crop basically means that, for example, you have an input image, right? Instead of putting this image into a model, you kind of just crop the uh, top left, top right, uh, bottom left, bottom right, uh, bottom right, and the central one as like, this is called five crop, and you flip them, and then it's called 10 crop. Ah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Again, use the trick of flipping, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, the trick of using flipping. Yeah. I okay. see. And this is how you, this is like once you built stuff, then you were, like did a lot of work to improve accuracy. Yeah. Or, well, I guess it'd be uh, recall uh, in this recall, case. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll see. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So. You uh, used Keras and TensorFlow. Looks uh, like this is the, this is the final result that you got. Yes, yes, yes. So actually, we have a because like we have AURC score or AOC score for all the fourteen diseases, and we kind of sum them together as a single metric for got the it. model. Yeah. So yeah. the fourteen diseases are the fourteen outputs that you had, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I see. And so eighty-four, which is which is very good. I mean, yeah. if if like for example, and I can see this in a scenario where like. If there's not a lot of medical staff around, uh -huh, uh -huh. you could actually line people up in order of like how confident the model might be that you have yes, something. That way, yeah. you could triage a little bit yes, better. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's still yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so let's yeah. talk about model visualization interpretation. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. So, uh, if you think about it, right? If you go to a hospital and you have a sort of a AI model helping you to say, "Hey, man, you have pneumonia," and you won't believe that because you say, "Okay, what the hell, right?" It yeah. just give you a single score, mm -hmm. right? So, one of the most important thing for deep learning model is about the interpret interpretation of, of the model, right? Okay. In that case, the reason why we want to interpret the model and visualize the model is that because the doctor will need it, and the patient probably also will want to take a look at, "Hey, what's going on in my test chest X-ray?" Right, yeah. and and the thing about it is, is if it says, yeah, you have this, uh -huh. it's like, okay, well, what do I do now? Now yeah. the doctor is going to actually need to go and look at the thing uh -huh. and figure it out. But yeah. the model already did some kind of work already that yeah. we can show, right? Yes, exactly. So this is one of the example where we say, okay, in this picture, the patient has uh, the disease is called like uh, cardiomegaly, basically means the heart is too big kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the top left is the original chest X-ray image. Right, and the, uh, this is our visualization for the model, saying, "Hey, this is probably where it goes wrong." I see. Right, and this is the highlight area, and then this is like an overlay of these two images. They say, "Okay, there, here, it goes wrong," and then this picture, the wrong, the red bounding box. Uh -huh. This bounding box is the kind of the ground truth labeled by some radiologist. And then this is like the prediction by our model uh, saying here. Oh, I yeah, see. So yeah. now you have, not only do you have uh, the actual prediction, uh -huh. but you also have like where the radiologist labeled the thing. And so you can actually accurately predict where the problem is as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the red, the bounding box is labeled by human being. And this uh, red kind of contour thing is labeled by the image, uh, sorry, by the model. I see. Yeah, so that's why I say, okay, the model uh, correctly identified this particular disease. That's pretty cool. So yeah. I, I asked you this question before, and yeah. uh, and I'm hoping that maybe you can help. Like, where, what did you export? It was like a protobuf file uh -huh. that you that uh -huh. it exported, or uh -huh. what is it that was the output of training this model? Uh -huh. Yeah. So we exported it to Onyx, and maybe Barrett can talk more. Okay. About it. Good. Yep. So so now I, I, are we done talking about everything that you've done here in this part? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now, and this is the part that's really interesting. Uh -huh. I, I love that that we uh -huh. actually can see all of this happening. Yeah. I love that we're doing some really awesome machine learning. But mm. now it's like. I always feel like we're missing the last yes, mile. Like, exactly. How do we yeah. actually put this out into something that can be used? Yeah. Oh, awesome. This is perfect. So you have a couple of options here, right? So you, you have um, uh, the option of actually taking the model in its native format mm -hmm. and then building an application. That's not cool, right? Because mm -hmm. then it, it loses portability. These days yeah. you build applications on multiple platforms yep. and so forth. Yep. And in here is where it comes Onyx which is one neural net exchange that was actually formed together originally by Microsoft and by uh, f uh, Facebook. Okay. And then we had a bunch of other partners actually join. And now you have a whole bunch of hardware vendors and software vendors that are backing this. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and the models that are supported are like today we have CNTK, PyTorch, Cafe2, MXNet, and Chainer. Those are the five popular frameworks for deep neural net that uh -huh. is available. And in this particular example, uh, we're going to be, they, I believe this was done using PyTorch yeah. and, and uh, Keras, and Keras too. Yeah. Yeah. And Keras is actually an abstraction layer on top of TensorFlow. Got it. Yeah. And, uh, so, so let me see if I understand. Onyx is like this way of like, of like getting output from machine learning algorithms, specifically from these current frameworks, and then putting it into a package that irrespective of where you trained them, the package can be consumed elsewhere. Exactly. Got it, okay. And more and more frameworks are beginning to standardize on Onyx almost think of it as like XML, if you will. Got it, okay. That's the best. That's or JSON, the, if we yeah, want to be more modern. Yeah, that's even better. Right, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, and so, what do we do here, right? So, uh, 
you generate, how do you generate the Onyx model? That's the brief protobuf that you said. All of the Onyx models in inherently use protobuf. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you have a couple of options. Some of the frameworks are great. They actually allow you to export directly to mm -hmm. Onyx. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they don't have it, so there are gonna be converters that are coming sure. to support it. In this particular case, we had both Keras as well as PyTorch. Through PyTorch, PyTorch has an exporter built in. Okay. So the, the, uh, the devs who built PyTorch decided, well, I'm gonna support Onyx, so I'm gonna yeah. allow you to export mine into an Onyx format, which, yeah. is, which is an Onyx file. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then the converters, we don't have time to cover it in this show. Uh -huh. I don't wanna steal the next yeah. show that is coming. Yeah. Over there, we're gonna show you how you can take the Keras model and then convert it to an Onyx file. Got it. Yeah. And then once you have this beautiful Onyx file, you essentially then, voila, use our, uh, you train in Azure, and then you take the Onyx model, you build an application, and right here, you're building a Windows application here, and then it's uh, actually, you can inference natively on Windows. Mm. Windows is gonna have this Windows machine learning built part of it, where I take this Onyx file, it reads natively, I drop it in, I build an application that uses this, and then I deploy it on Windows, and I don't need to bring any other runtimes and stuff. Windows will natively inference that for you. And to me, this is amazing, because I've always preached the gospel of, think of machine learning as APIs that are just built in a different way, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Instead of you coming up with a series of steps, it comes up with, you give it data and it comes up with its own thing. Mm -hmm. And now we can pass these Onyx models, models around as if they were references to execution. Exactly. Yes. And with Windows ML, then you just burn them right into the application. Exactly, you just consume it, throw it in Visual Studio, you write a bunch of code, we're gonna show it in the next uh, mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. the, it supports multiple languages, and you have this application, you can either ship it to the store or deploy it to a PC, yes. and then you have it right uh -huh. there. Fantastic, and so I mean that's, like your bit was like super short. I mean, that's the part that it should be, right? Once you, <laughs> yeah. once you actually build these things, you should just like drag them in and things should happen. Yeah, the beauty is that as an AI developer, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about what the data scientist has actually built. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll have to sit with my peer and then understand what these actually mean, what language yeah. did you write? Yeah. But right yeah. now, yeah. I'm just taking this Onyx model and I yeah. know how to use it. Yeah. Boom, I'm just off yeah. there developing yeah. as it. As a resource file. Yeah, and effectively like, if you think about it, like, it, the previous way, you would have to understand how the graph was built, uh -huh. yes, and then you'd yeah. have to like dictionary into like the specific area of the graph, uh -huh. and then you'd have to pass some weirdness in and uh -huh. pass some weirdness uh -huh. out, uh -huh. and yeah. it's not, not yeah. so fun. Yeah, really quickly, uh, you have so much support in the open source, there is even a Neutron as one of the uh, visualizers for Onyx. Mm -hmm. People are building support through Onyx, you're gonna mm -hmm. see this grow. Mm -hmm. Right here, you throw this file, Mm. into Neutron and it mm -hmm. shows you the graph completely out mm -hmm. here. Yes. And if you haven't seen Neutron, it's actually pretty amazing. It visualizes these things in a way that you're like, oh, this is what the computer is doing. This uh, is how exactly. it's executing. Because yes, yes. in reality, and I hate to burst everyone's bubbles, uh -huh, but uh -huh. machine learning is really just learning a bunch of weights. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> and once right. we have the right weights, right, then yeah. it can calculate it's the right yes, yes. Just a bunch of yeah, weights. Yeah. And then it supports many different frameworks like TensorFlow, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All Fantastic. Support. All right. Do you have anything to show us? Else? Yeah. I just want to give you a peek sneak into what's coming up next. Okay. Since mm -hmm. we don't have time in here, I just want to show you like how this uh, stuff actually works. And you have a bunch of x-rays here. This is what Sean showed us. And here is the app that actually was built using yeah. Windows. And we'll have a deeper dive session in the, in the, in the upcoming okay. session soon. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty amazing. OK, so just to recap and, and, and to finish up, um, the important bits here is that you went through the standard machine learning process. Mm -hmm. You used your machine learning framework of choice. Yeah. You went through the same challenges that every machine learning practitioner has. Yeah. And then when you were done, you said, here you go. And uh -huh. because you were using PyTorch, you were uh -huh. just able to export the model using Onyx. Yeah. And then you as an AI developer took the Onyx model as if it was a resource or an assembly yeah. or whatever, yeah. dropped it in, and then were able to call it directly using Windows ML. Now, Windows ML is doing inferencing. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely, it's doing in the, in inferencing or scoring, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. It's, it takes the new set of data that it comes, the app actually loads it and passes it to this runtime that Windows has mm -hmm. built into it and it gives you the score which the app converts to tell you what disease is in this yeah. case. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. This is pretty amazing. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. We're learning Thank all you. about how to do machine learning. And we've also learned about this new thing called Windows ML, which is pretty amazing. Hopefully you'll stay tuned for the next show where we'll talk a little bit more about how to use it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you Thank next you. time. Thank you. Thank you.